Okay, everyone, so we want to formally welcome everyone to the Say What webinar. This is our first Say What of 2018. It is over Texas Tobacco for Youth, and this is where we'll be sharing and discussing how to be more effective to recruit, um, involve, and keep middle and high school students engaged in tobacco prevention. So first, I would like to formally introduce myself. My name is Carlos Vela. I am from Ingleside, Texas. I now live in Corpus Christi. I've lived here for about a year now. Um, I am a freshman at Texas A&M University of Corpus Christi. I am majoring in biomedical sciences, hopefully to become a cardiothoracic surgeon one day. So fingers crossed. I'm applying for an internship today, so hopefully I get it. Um, a little bit about me, I was um, 18 ambassador for Say What for three years in high school, and now I am currently a consultant for the program. So I kind of help guide and mentor the teen ambassadors throughout the year. Okay, so I just want to give you a quick um, review of today's agenda. So we have, uh, we'll be talking about the youth adult partnerships, um, how to involve youth in tobacco prevention, opportunities and resources to involve youth, and then towards the end, the remaining time we have left, we will have Q&A. And if you don't want to speak, or if you can't speak, you can just type it in the chat box below. Okay, and so today we have some incredible guests with us on the webinar. Um, we have myself, of course, Carlos Vela, and then we have um, my high school sponsor, DJ Gonzalez. She's from Ingleside. Um, we have Aman Amanda Kennedy, who is also a youth specialist coordinator for her TPC organization in Wichita Falls. Um, we have Kathleen Bates. She is the youth specialist for the Stay What program, so she oversees uh, the entire Teen Ambassador uh, program. And then we have Reggie Kahayan, who is the uh, program manager for Say What. Okay, so now at this time, I'm just going to hand it over to Reggie to take over this next part. Awesome. Thanks, Carlos. So we're super excited that everyone's able to join us this morning. We're, we'll be talking about how, as adults, we can do a better job of recruiting young people, uh, getting them involved, but then getting them involved in such a way so that they stay involved with the organizations that we work with. Um, a lot of you all that are logged in today work with coalitions uh, at the county and community level. So obviously the, the challenges can be unique, especially uh, working at the community level versus working in school specifically. So we're really fortunate to have guests um, like DJ and Amanda that will be able to share both of those kinds of perspectives. Um, but at the heart of what we're talking about is youth adult partnership. And I want to just take like, literally about a minute to talk about um, Heart's Ladder of Youth Engagement. And just as a resource, you can, I invite you to Google it later. Um, the webinar will also be archived. So if it's something that you want to look at later or share with other adults that you work with or uh, other adults that work with young people, you'll have the opportunity to do that. But if you look up Hearts Ladder of Youth Participation, of Youth Engagement, you'll find uh, different translations of the ladder. But basically at the bottom is adults using young people uh, at the lowest level of engagement. So giving them things to do, telling them what to do, and in some cases just using them as uh, representatives, but they're not having true involvement. As we move farther up the ladder, we give young people more responsibilities, uh, we give them more opportunities to not only have things to do, but then to also lead different activities, projects in their entirety, those kinds of things. Um, and truly what we want to work towards, the term that we like to use, is youth adult partnership. And that doesn't necessarily mean equal, but it's young people and adults together giving what they have available um, and then fill, fulfilling the responsibilities that are in front of them too. So. Hang on to that. Definitely Google it if you don't have a copy of it and try and identify the different places uh, that we are as adults and then also young, the young people that we work with uh, will be at different places along the ladder as well based on the, how they're, what they're capable of doing. So with that being said, 
Uh, we definitely will talk uh, and, and hear from uh, our resident young person uh, on the panel today. We're really excited to have uh, the panel, the webinar, set up the way that it does, um, the way that it is, because we don't want this to just be about the information that we're sharing, but we really want you all to take the opportunity to connect with people, not only today, but also in the future. So if you happen to have questions and you want to connect with Carlos and Amanda and DJ and Kathleen in the future, uh, we really encourage you all to do that. So Carlos, go ahead and get us, uh, get us started and tell us a little bit about how you got started. Um, how old were you when you first got involved, <clears throat> just in general as a youth advocate? Um, I was about 14 years old. I was a freshman in high school. Um, that's when I first got involved with tobacco prevention. I, at the time, I didn't know a lot about tobacco um, in general nor prevention work. Um, the only thing I knew about tobacco was that my mother was a smoker. Um, and at the time, I honestly don't know if I knew if it was bad or good. So when I got involved with SAD uh, my freshman year, which is Students Against Destructive Decisions, um, they focused heavily on tobacco prevention. And so there was a lot of, uh, through the SAD organization that I was part of, there was a lot of teen ambassadors uh, for Say What that did a lot of tobacco prevention control work. And so just getting involved uh, with SAD, I learned, I, was, I got informed about tobacco prevention and tobacco use and the harmful effects. And so throughout the year, I just started, you know, attending these events, helping, doing what I can, getting my feet wet. And then from there, I just learned about the harmful effects of tobacco. So 14 years old, so that was four or five years ago now? Yeah, five years. <laughs> <laughs> would you, even though you said that your mom was a smoker at the time, would you say that you were already passionate about tobacco prevention? Did you feel one way or the other about it. I know you mentioned you weren't sure whether it was good or bad, but when you first started learning about it, did you know what was your stance on it? Um, at the time, I wasn't passionate about tobacco prevention um, because I was still learning about it. And at the time, um, I wasn't passionate at the time, but at the time I was passionate about making a difference. And so when my sponsor saw that I had a passion for like wanting to serve others, to volunteer, um, it was just one of those ways for me to make a difference in my community by getting involved with tobacco prevention. So throughout the year of my freshman year, just learning about tobacco uh, use, um, hearing other people's stories on how they're, they are affected from tobacco, whether that's from they have a relative that smokes or they being a smoker themselves or just learning everyone's story as to why they got involved. Um, it made me realize that these potential situations could happen within my own life and I wanted to prevent that from happening. So um, over the course of my freshman and sophomore year, I kind of developed a passion um, for tobacco prevention because it just became more realistic just hearing these stories like real people telling me their stories on how they are getting sick from secondhand smoke or how they have loved ones who have died from tobacco related diseases and so uh, it took over the course of those two years to develop a passion and it was kind of hard for me even throughout the entire I felt like I haven't like I had not found my story as to why I got involved with tobacco prevention until towards the end of my junior and uh, senior year. Okay. So one of the things that you know you talked a lot about um, hearing other people's stories. Um, you know the people that are attending the webinar right now, basically adults that work with young people in some capacity. So tell us a little bit about what your adult sponsor did, who we have on the panel today, uh, Donna Gonzalez. Tell us about some of the things that she did to help um, help you grow from where you were as a 14 year old and just along your journey and development as a youth advocate and as a leader. Okay, so my adult sponsor, um, she was incredible, not just because she's on here, and I'm not just saying that because she's on here, but she truly was. Um, so like, some of the things that come to mind right away that um, she did that helped me grow as a person was that I remember my freshman year, I was always going to her asking her what needed to be done. And so anytime I went to her, there was always something to be done because she was the sponsor of two organizations. She's a teacher, a mother. So there was a lot of things that she could not get to that she needed students to help with. And so I would just go to her and she would just give me something to do. And um, 
at the time, it didn't matter if it was something as small as, you know, creating the agenda for the next meeting or going, doing the bigger things such as like going to the principals to get approval for this or that. Um, if a student went to her, she was willing to give them something to do because she saw that they wanted to dedicate their time to this organization. She saw that they had the passion, the commitment to do it, and um, so she gave them the task. And so that kind of helped me grow as a person because uh, it made me just realize like no task is too little to do. And so um, I was always willing to just step in when I needed to step up uh, for her. Um, something else that she did that really just has always stuck with me that I've always said about her was that my freshman year, my first semester, she told me that she believed in me, um, particularly for like a big award that the Yaya Award, Youth Advocate of the Year Award, that I could one day win it. And at the time I didn't know much about it, but um, all I knew was like, that was something to look forward to throughout um, high school was that I have a chance at winning a national award because she saw that it had potential. And so it made me want to work harder. It made me want to just keep doing the things I'm doing and to grow. Um, so yeah, those are some things that she did was just, you know, uh, give me things to do when I went to her. She took advantage of, uh, she saw that I had passion. She saw that I was willing to work and she took advantage of that. And I think that's, of the beauty behind an adult who takes advantage of someone who has a passion for something because when they take advantage of that passion um, and tap into it then a lot of incredible things could happen throughout the course of the next few years and it truly did because by the end of my high school graduation I became not only the South Region Youth Advocate of the Year but the National Youth Advocate of the Year for the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Awesome. Yeah, so I, I, and I love that you recap those, the two things. One, she just got you involved. She gave you things to do, whether it was little or big. But then the thing that I really heard you say that, that I think is, is really important is she explicitly said that she, she believed in you and, and valued you as a person. So I think that that's really important. Um, finally, um, and we'll be brief so we can move um, on and you can actually talk to DJ, is um, tell us about a time that things didn't go right. They might have, you might have failed at something or fell short. Um, how did you respond, but then also how did, uh, how did your adult sponsor respond to you? Okay, so um, that question is kind of hard because I can't really think of anything, but the thing that does come to mind, I guess, that I could use is just that um, so throughout my high school years, I was constantly trying to uh, push forward with the smoke-free ordinance for Ingleside, Texas. And so um, towards the end of my, or the, after the first semester of my senior year, I finally had got the council to vote on the ordinance and it fell short by one vote. And so um, at the time I felt like I failed, like it was just one vote. We were sure we had the, like, the four votes we needed, but um, it turned out we only had three. And so um, the way that um, we responded was, um, at the time it was just like, okay, this is okay, like maybe we'll come back later and you know push forward again and so we were just done with it but luckily I got a call from one of the city councilmen that told me about uh, a thing called a referendum where we can go get signatures and uh, start a petition to get the public to vote on it and so at the time my sponsor and I we uh, did everything we could to get the, the amount of p petitions we needed to uh, kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for, to kind of overgo the city council, like by just like getting more petitions to uh, take it to the public to vote. And so we literally called every, we literally found everyone we could in the public. We went to all the teachers throughout the entire district. We went to friends, families, everyone, anyone, anyone we could think of. And so um, the thing, the point about, the point I want to get to about this uh, example is just that even though at the time it felt like a failure, it was still a win for us because it showed that the youth has a voice uh, when it comes to policy issues and that my sponsor continued to encourage me and tell me to, uh, she constantly was just there to like say like, I can do this. Uh, she told me that we could 
that um, we've got this far, so let's just keep going, you know, there's no backing down. And at the end of the day, it still felt like a big accomplishment, just, you know, gain a big awareness because you know the bars uh, owners at the time were definitely coming at us with everything they had too and it was a very um incredible insightful experience overall and so um it was just great to have my sponsor dj gonzalez with me there throughout the whole years because i don't think i could have done it by myself if i didn't have her <laughs> Well, that's a perfect transition now. Um, Carlos, I'm going to hand the baton over to you as you host um, Moving Forward. Moving Forward. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I would like to formally introduce my um, former sponsor slash teacher, um, Donna Gonzalez. She was our student council sponsor, and she was the formal stu former student against destructive decisions sponsor, as well as an English teacher, as well as a mother of five. She literally does it all, and I don't know how, but she's taught me her ways. So, Miss um, Gonzalez, I haven't said Miss in a while. <laughs> Can you please formally introduce yourself? I mean, well, basically, he kind of said it all, but uh, yeah, I, I've been teaching. This is my 20th year of teaching. I can't believe that. And uh, I, uh, I was a coach for nine years, and then... When I got out of coaching, I came to Ingleside and I became the SAD sponsor and the student council sponsor. And uh, so I've had several, I've had several uh, team ambassadors that have come to the program. And then, of course, I've had um, Carlos as well as Darian Skinner win regional uh, Yaya awards as well as Carlos winning the national awards. So that's some great student center. Yeah, I think it was all great because we had someone like you in our lives. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so um, first, um, my first question to you is, so um, how long have you worked with youth and in what capacities? Okay, so uh, basically um, I, like I said about the coaching, so, you know, and, and at the, the first two years of my coaching, I was, uh, I was pretty crazy because I, I had a passion and, you know, for coaching and I, but I, at the same time, I, I kind of, I was uh, so into winning uh, that that drive was very easy. So then, when I decided to do SAD student council, the same thing applied when I was um, when I decided to be the sponsor of those things. So um, I just constantly pushed myself and made sure that I, I just wanted things to, uh, I guess, just like go a certain way within the organizations. And so that's kind of where you guys come in, like Carlos or other people that decided to be driven and want to come to me with things. I always give them things to do because there are always a lot of things to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, have you always had success working with you? Um, and that, uh, you know, I kind of wrote something down about that because uh, I remember um, the first year of SAD, and um, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't what Carlos is explaining. Um, I didn't even know. I didn't even know what the SAD was. Honestly, I had no clue what the acronym was. I knew about that. I never knew about SAD. And so um, I ended up getting uh, th that year. I had like six students in SAD. That was it. And um, I it was just kind of thrown in my lap because it was my first year at Ingleside. And so we ended up getting a postcard though from the Texas School Safety Center about the summit. And um, we kind of like just remembered it. We like, oh, well, this seems kind of cool, but I had no clue. So, uh, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do with that. So all we did was retro roll. Well, the next year, I had Darian Skinner come in as a freshman, and we got the postcard again for the Texas School Safety Center. So, um, and we decided, hey, why, don't, why not take a chance and go to Zephyr and, and see what it's all about, see maybe what we can do with our organization. And so um, that literally changed my life and the life of so many, of so many teens because we went to that summit and we learned about the tobacco prevention and we learned what we could do with it. We did team bonding exercises. We learned how to do you know, penguin and penguin power team and fun activities like that. We learned how to 
we learn how to be able to ourselves go to the junior high and elementary street and be able to um, put on something for them that could show them about tobacco, tobacco prevention. And so that summit, that literally changed our life. Awesome, definitely. So that's kind of what it looked like for you when you started working with youth, in a way. Especially with, especially with that, you know. I mean, I, I already, you know, with coaching and everything, I kind of knew how to, like, drive people and stuff. But then once I got sad in my lap, that, you know, when that happened, when that summit happened, that made everything so clear to me because it, it became my passion as well as other kids that were in the organization. Yeah, definitely. So um, now we're moving on to working with uh, youth key things. So what are some key things you've learned that helped you uh, be more successful working with youth? I mean, the main thing that any adult needs to know uh, with working with youth is that the youth have a powerful voice and you need to let them use it. You know, um, many people, they think that maybe like only people will listen to adults, but it's not the case. The youth, the youth are the ones that like will drive on things. Like a lot of adults will talk the talk, but not walk the walk. The students will actually like put forth ideas and they'll actually go through with it because they want something to be done. And, um, you know, don't, for any adult, don't expect that ever youth is going to be all about it either. I mean, I've had many years that it's like they never come to me. And after, they just come to a meeting, and that's it. You know, they don't do anything else. Um, because of their studies, their sports, or maybe they're not as driven as someone like Carlos. But if you, if you push them in a way that, go, like, as far as depending on what their passion is, if you push into that way, then they will work for you. And uh, they will have that drive. And, and with the adult and the youth, like, we achieve amazing things. Definitely. I was there to witness it with her. Um, so what are some key things you do now that you didn't used to do um, that has helped you be more su successful working with the youth? I've, def I've definitely let them take the lead, you know, um, because it's really hard as an adult to let them take the lead. You know, it, it, it makes, as an adult, you think, and especially as a teacher, I'm used to leading, you know, even in teaching. But even right now, I'm doing a debate in my classes, and the kids are taking the lead. And it's amazing the, the kind of uh, collaborations and things that you can discover from what the youth have to say. And so it's the same thing with your organization. It's like, you know, you, I, I try to push hard, but at the same time, I try to take, let them take the lead so that they can be successful in what we're doing. Yeah, definitely. I kind of want to speak towards that a little bit more because we've worked together. So when she says, like, she lets the youth take the lead, like, she literally lets them, like, start the whole, like, say if there's a big event we're doing, she literally has them, you know, uh, think of ideas, do all the behind the scenes work, and then like she doesn't, like she's there, but like she sees like if things are going smoothly. So like the youth literally are kind of in charge of the entire event. And so it's a very, uh, for youth who, who like get the opportunity for my sponsor, it's very um, awesome because like it kind of teaches us a lot of professional skills, um, lets us kind of get the idea of like the steps to what it takes to, you know, host an event. Um, but she was there if there was something that needed to be done or she was there to give us advice or like to do this or that, like to help us, you know, make sure we're doing things right though. But it was, she literally had it where the youth literally just did the entire event. And it was pretty awesome because you're, when we host like school events, it was just like, we have these youth students who are like, um, leading the entire school, like when it came to like our tobacco free marches each year. So um, it's a definitely great, you know, that's a definitely key thing uh, when it comes with working with youth. Um, and so uh, my next question to you is um, what are some things you regularly struggle with when working with youth? The main word that comes to mind is failure. I, I you know, it's hard. And I think for any adult, for an event or an activity to fail. And so that's when I would step in a lot. And then towards the end there, the last couple of years, I pretty much let those students, like if they fail, they fail. Um, you know, and for example, uh, 
you know, Jake, he came up with this Life is Rough event, and um, he was going to have it at the skate park, and he was supposed to do all the media for it, he was supposed to, like, get it all done, and um, he did it. And I told him, I was like, look, I said, hey, you didn't get me out, so you're not going to have many people show up. And sure enough, he did it. He only had about five or six show up, you know. But I, it was hard for me. It was so hard. But um, I had to just let it be. And Carlos had an event as well that was at the skate park. So it was mm-hmm. the weather. It wasn't anything. Like, he put it out there. People knew about it. But it was so cold and so wet. And only a few people came, but, but he still took advantage of the opportunity because guess what? He called the news people. He made sure that they were coming no matter what, even if it was cold. And they came out there, and the people that were out there, it made it seem like there was a big event showing that was going on on the news, even though there was only a few people that were actually there that were the worst. <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, I guess I could have definitely used that. I I forgot about that. I could have definitely used that as my example of when I fell at something. So, like, we had this event that we were trying to get support from um, the community to get uh, for the smoke-free ordinance. And so at the time, um, what I came up with was uh, to do a tobacco-free walk. And so... Um, we, so like, we literally made flyers, we put that throughout, we put it throughout the entire district, we went to all the schools, hand them out, um, gave it to all the little kids to take home to their parents, to, you know, get their families involved, uh, we made t-shirts, we've made all these, uh, creative, like, cute little tobacco-free games, it, this took, like, at least three months in advance, like, plan, I called the news, it was a crazy experience, like, uh, the and then like our big poster we made that we put on the fence just kept falling off and it was just it was very cold it was very rainy and I remember I mean the way the way we responded was it was like um, it was like even though a lot of people didn't come Miss Gonzalez was right like we had the news come and it seemed like we had a big event even though the news said at the time that it kind of, it was canceled even though they were there to film it it was I don't know it was kind of funny it was funny but very um, you know, just like it was an experience. Experience we're gonna say though, <laughs> something I would not forget. Um, but yes, um, next. So um, we want you to share an example of how you've created safe opportunities for youth to succeed or fail. Um, you know, I I would say that you know, as far as I'm thinking about safe opportunities, I mean, <sighs> there's been many, but there we had this family fun fair that um, I know with Darian, he had come up with, he made this big event, and um, he, uh, we made it where people had to have uh, uh, different, like, uh, I guess, to have different coupons to be able to, like, go on the bouncy houses and stuff. We made sure it was, like, at our school so that people felt safe to be able to go to bring their kids to the event, um, and... Uh, we had face painting. We had all kinds of different things. And uh, they, we also gave them little bags that they could take home with with different stuff that we got from our TPC. And um, so that was, like, I guess, like, something that we did, that we, we did. I think a lot of people, there were a lot of people that came through. About a 1,000 people came through with kids. And, um, you know, to fail, I guess I, could, I would say also I would fail advocating for the, for the law. You know, uh, there was a safe environment for it at the same time. Um, I didn't like, obviously on social media, it would be so hard. And because Carlos, um, you know, he's open with his ideas in public on Facebook and stuff, he did get some backlash there. But he, we did do it at the council meeting, and so that was a safe environment to do it at uh, because, like, there were not really, there were no problems, you know, um, and he did go to the different bar owners, and he didn't have any problems. The main thing that he had a problem with was on social media, so I would say that was the only place that I could see um, as far as not as safe is on social media. You just never know, and they don't care that he was an 18-year-old trying to get this accomplished. I mean, they were going after him no matter what age he is, so, yeah. DJ, this is Reggie. So, um, for the sake of time, so we can move on to Amanda too, I do want to ask you one last quick question. Um, if you could tell us 
briefly, like what was the difference between working with a youth like Carlos, like Darian, and, and some of your more successful young people versus working with just your your average typical high school students? What what was the difference? Right when Darian or Carlos came in, or those that have been successful, right away. I mean, they were they wanted something to do. They were constantly asking me. They would come in my room. They would make sure that they had something going on. They were driven. They were passionate, just like Carlos said about his passion. Um, and even though they didn't know where they were going with that passion, they wanted something. Um, he's as hard-headed and stubborn as stubborn any school I could have um, um, And he didn't like my bluntness because I'm very blunt, um, and I'll tell him like it is. But, he, but the, the difference is, is that he then appreciated it and realized what I was trying to do with it, and he, he pushed himself even more so because of what I told him. So that's the difference between those. They, didn't, they might not have liked it, what I said, but they used it to fuel their fire. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. With that, Carlos, I'll toss it back to you. Yeah, okay, so thank you, um, DJ, or Miss Gonzalez. I mean, I'm out of high school, but thank you. Uh, I think she'll be hopping off shortly because she is in school right now, and she has to go eat lunch and get back to her classes. So thank you uh, very much for all that. It was very insightful, um, and I think very, um, definitely very insightful for the other sponsors who are here with us today. Um, okay, so next we're going to move on to our next guest star webinar, um, which is Amanda Kennedy. She, uh, like I said, is from Wichita Falls, and I would like you to please introduce yourself a little. Absolutely. So um, I'm Amanda Kennedy. I'm a certified tobacco treatment specialist, a health educator here at the Wichita Falls, Wichita County Public Health District. Awesome. Um, okay, so how long have you worked with the youth and in what capacities as well? So I just want to say thank you to DJ because DJ has definitely helped me as another um, health educator just out in the communities trying to advance our work. So thank you so much DJ and to you Carlos as well. <clears throat> To specifically answer your question, I have worked with youth for about 15 years. Um, the way that I have worked with youth is um, with Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, youth group organizations such as church groups and, and things like that. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to get into uh, working in schools and like obstacles that you might face. So. Since you you are not um, in the same school every day and seeing and working with the same students on a regular basis, what are some of the obstacles you face when working with youth as a community organization? Well, I would say the first thing is probably establishing and building relationships. And that's establishing and building relationships with youth and adult partners. Um, trying to get that point of contact in the school so that you can get in the school system, then you have access to the students, and then once you have access to the students, then building and establishing a relationship uh, with each one of those, with each one of the youth. And then um, along with that has been travel. Um, because we are not in a school, we have a lot of difficulty with travel because Wichita Falls is housed in the middle of pretty much of the county, but then we outreach to Iowa Park, which is about 20 minutes, Burke Burnett, which is about 20 minutes, and um, Electra, which is about 35 minutes, and so getting everyone to be at the same place at the same time is a struggle for sure. Okay, um, definitely. So when... Um what did you, uh, before we get to the next question, um, I think someone just said in the chat box if you could speak a little bit louder or closer to the mic for when you answer these oh, next yeah, absolutely. questions. Okay. Is that better, guys? If you just say yes, say something, Amanda? Is this better? I apologize, guys. I think that's better. I can hear better. Okay. So, um, yes, they said much better. No problem. Uh, okay. So, um, working in schools and getting started. So, what did it look like when you first started? Oh, 
Um, so when we first started, uh, we started out at the Boys and Girls Clubs. And so working with the Boys and Girls Club was a, was a challenge because there are so many. We have about five Boys and Girls Clubs here in Wichita Falls, and then we have Burke Burnett Boys and Girls Clubs. And then in Iowa Park, we don't have a Boys and Girls Club or anything established for uh, regarding a youth organization, so to speak. So it was really, I'm going to revert back to the last question, it was really about trying to establish relationships with the adult partners that were at the schools. And that was a big obstacle. We also had to, um, we, had, we had some challenges trying to work with some adults. Um, they're not always the easiest to to reach according to their time and in the classroom and then what they're willing to do outside of their regimented work week okay definitely um <clears throat> so um when we work so now we're gonna talk about adult attitudes so my next question to you is what were some of your attitudes and behaviors about how to work with youth uh, what attitudes have changed and which ones are still the same oh you give me dicey questions um so working with youth I can honestly say at first, no one really stepped up to the plate. Um, I think there was some concerns on how you work with youth and work in a health department. Um, because the view of a health department first is one of enforcement instead of prevention and, and, and an environment where youth go to have fun or to do things that are going to be inspirational. A uh, health department is somewhere where you go to get an injection or, um, or uh, follow a law or a procedure. And so trying to change that was a big barrier. And um, I, think we've, I think we've done a really good job. Um, we've had a lot of turnover in, in the grant and, and some different things. And I think that turnover has created some great opportunities for people to step in that have uh, been a little bit more willing to work with youth. Um, and, and I don't mean just, I don't mean staff, I mean, just in the community as a whole, turnover in other in other job areas, things like that. It, it's been really great to see the um, the growth that that has been allowed. Oh, okay, that's that's good then. Um, so, um, what are you doing differently that is working? Um, what have you done since the beginning that continues to help you have successful or successes with working with youth? Because I know you said at the beginning it was a uh, kind of hard to you know get transportation and uh, finding you know youth to do things. So what have you done differently? And um, you know there it's always a, there's always new difficulties or new challenges that come. But honestly, um, extreme youth leadership has been key. Um, in helping us to establish the relationships between the adults and the youth and the trainings that we have been offered. Also, Say What uh, trainings from the Texas State Safety Center. That has been super great. Um, the support that we have received from everyone there has been instrumental in helping me get tools so that I can help the youth, which helps the community. So that that's probably been one of the key elements uh, of working with the youth is having that structure set in place. And then also my safety net has been the health department and how they make sure that I'm focused and that I stay where I need to be um, in order to help the community or help the youth help the community. Okay, that's good. So, um, what's it called? Um, that's awesome, actually. So, my next thing, um, can you share an example of how you've created uh, safe opportunities you uh, for youth to succeed and or fail? Um, yeah, can I go back to the last question just, just for a second? Yeah, One of the Absolutely. biggest things that I really wanted to share with that uh, last question um, is also we started out using Remind.com, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's an app that you can use to reach the different youth in your community. So we had to have a point that we could take. So we would 
outreach to all of the different schools in the community, but we needed to have a way to funnel all of the contacts with the youth through a certain system. And so we started to use Remind.com. Well, the youth didn't love Remind.com so much, uh, so we had to start using a different app once the youth decided to be involved. So Remind.com has been used as more of a recruitment tool, and uh, now we use uh, Group... Uh, group Me. What group is it me. called? Thank you. Group Me. Now we use Group Me, um, and it helps to give us some structure, and I can only talk to a specific youth if I need to, like our um, steering committee, or I can talk to the whole group, depending on. And I really love uh, Group Me a lot, and that actually was, of course, through, I think, um, Audra being part of the Tina Bastards. Yeah, for sure. Sorry. Uh Oh no, you're good. Yeah, so definitely. Let's do the so, next question. Yeah. Oh no, it's okay. We, uh, so, um, what's it called? So you were saying like Remind Me like wasn't really working for you, but Group Me was a better. Yeah, I know when I in high school, uh, when I use uh, as a student council president, um, we used uh, Remind Me as just like sending reminders to everyone, not just like to like communicate, but like you know, just like hey, there's an event tomorrow. Don't forget, because um, it's very easy to, on Remind Me to schedule just like when you want to send them out so you can legit like have an officer like use remind me on Monday set out all the remind me's for the week or a month or something like that and you don't even have to worry about it because you have it all set you know and then group me definitely great communication a lot of organizations use that so I definitely recommend that too um, so yeah the next question is um, can you share an example of, of how you've created safe opportunities for the youth to succeed or fail Yes, so one of the biggest things that I probably have come across personally is defining what success will be um, with the youth. So um, we did a Red Ribbon Week event and we really wanted a lot of attendance. That was how we were going to, that's how the adults were going to measure our success. When after we held the event, the Red Ribbon Week event, um, we realized that the success was in allowing the youth to brainstorm the event, plan the event, and execute the event. We did not have very many attendees, and we felt really sad about that, but then we also realized like they did this event all on their own, and they had ownership in that, and it was really a great, uh, a great way for them to realize that they had succeeded in one way, but you know, it also put us adults in check of well, just because you don't have a lot of attendance at an event doesn't mean that that's not an excess for your group. Definitely. Um, okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, I'll hand it back off to uh, Reggie. Awesome, thanks, Carlos. And I don't know about you all, but I've really been enjoying just hearing from, I, I've known DJ and Amanda for, for a little while now, DJ for a long time, and it's still been really cool to hear in detail some of the ways that you approach working with young people. Now, we want to move the needle a little bit and start talking about not just strategies and things that we need to be thinking about as adults that work with young people, but what are some steps that we can take? What are some tangible, practical things that we can do to get them involved? Um, so one of the things that we focus on messaging-wise and is a, a new theme or campaign for Say What this year is our Live the Life tobacco-free theme, our Live the Life campaign. So if we could get DJ, our host, to uh, cue up the video. If you haven't seen it yet, then definitely want you all to, to think of this more as a video, as uh, an example of, instead of talking with young people about what not to do, what are some ways that we can talk with young people about how we want them to live and how they can get involved? I like to play the ukulele I because play the ukulele. By the way, if I could invite the presenters, we'll need to make sure we mute our mics so we don't get echo. Daily because it's easy and it just has a certain noise that it's always happy. I don't think that you can ever make a sad note with ukulele. 
last year I played basketball and I'm in band. I love hiking, drumming. I like to read because it just kind of, it helps me focus. I love playing football, running, swimming. I'm in a lot of student organizations like NHS, Student Council, Shag. I love volunteering. I love making a difference. It's important to you know be able to serve others and be there for those who are in need. I'm able to go to school, chase after my dreams, do the things that I'm passionate about and love the most because I'm tobacco free. I have so many things to do. There's just no time to be stressing over a product that's addictive. It's really important that I stay tobacco free. If you smoke, it's gonna mess up your lungs and you won't be able to live the life that you want. I think that me living tobacco free is honestly the best thing that I can do. Everyone should live the life and they should live it tobacco free. Technical difficulties, apologies for that. Um, with that being said though, we'll go ahead and shift again the conversation. Um, Carlos, if you want to take the baton here and uh, talk with, let's see, I think we still have CJ on, possibly, I know Amanda's still on, um, and just chat about some examples of some different ways we can get young people involved in tobacco prevention. Definitely. Um, I think Gonzalez is actually leaving, so we have Amanda. Um, but uh, we want to talk about some examples of activities um, that the youth have helped lead. Um, so Amanda, do you have any examples on how the youth have invited people to live healthy, tobacco-free lifestyles? Absolutely. Um, so. There we go. Um, so if you see here, this is um, Holly and Audra, and they are uh, at Texas Oklahoma Fair. So this is a, a yearly event that comes to Wichita Falls, and um, so we go out there, we educate, advocate, and initiate um, change in Wichita Falls, Wichita County. Okay, awesome. That's just one of the ways, and then, sorry, and then there's, uh, of course, multiple ways we, toba Texas Tobacco Free Kids Day, and then World No Tobacco Day, we usually try to uh, have an event or something like that, and of course, like you said earlier, um, because we're not housed in a school, we're housed in the health department, um, we don't have like a school... I say ready-made easy, it's not really even easy to have an event at a school, but it's, to me, would seem a little more ready-made to be easier um, to have an event at a school. And so every year we have to get a little more creative because the youth do not like to recreate every event every, they, no, they like to recreate every event every year. They do not like to do the same thing over and over again. That gets a little interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> what's it called? So yeah, we there's a lot of different events um, people can do. There's Kick Butts Day or slash Tobacco Free Kids Day. Um, Red Ribbon Week is also a good, a great week that my high school organization uh, did a lot of tobacco prevention um, work on. There's also a Great American Smoke Out campaign um, and other days like Amanda said. Um, and so moving on, those are just some things, because um, we're cutting it close to time, so we want to make sure we get through the whole thing. Um, I want to hand it back to Reggie for the social media um, section. Absolutely. Thanks, Carlos. So I'll be brief here. Um, the idea regarding uh, social media and young people, I know as adults we can be nervous about the things that they may post, or are we going to be able to trust the things that they post? 
we're, what we're talking about isn't having necessarily having young people create contents or even manage the actual channels for a community organization, for a school organization, but posting on their own platforms, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, etc. So one of the ways to help save time is instead of creating original content, to curate and share content that's already been created. So you'll see on this slide, there are a lot of handles, obviously TXA What is one of those, but a lot of different channels on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, where these campaigns, some of which are national, many of which are national, have already created video and image content that you can repost for your own use when getting involved in tobacco prevention. And both as adults as well as young people reposting that information uh, amongst the people that uh, follow them and then this definitely being a way to, to easily have content that you use for your organizations. And then because of who we've got online right now, there are a lot of you all that have staff that create fantastic content for social media as well. I encourage you to steal each other's stuff. Um, and then also if you're able to, if there's something specific you want to use, uh, ask them for the original file and if you've got permission to, to redevelop it so it, it fits your branding and, and maybe even your messaging. So that being said, um, we'll skip actually examples so we can get into some real tangible resources um, and other ways that we can get young people involved. Um, one real quick that I, I'd love to touch on for both Carlos and Amanda is to have you talk a little bit about peer education. Um, so if you could, uh, Carlos, tell us about you know what, it, what it's like being a peer educator, working with high school students and maybe even going and working with middle school or elementary school students in your community. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so working um, with high school difference is definitely going to be a different environment than working with you know middle school, elementary students. Um, when it comes to elementary and middle middle school students, there's a lot of fun um, energizers you can do with them because they like to have fun. But also how you present the content has to be definitely different because you know elementary and middle school students don't really know or have a big or large uh, vocabulary yet. So. And kind of have to just simplify things down to where they understand it kind of like just like you know when it comes to elementary students you have to say like you know smoking is bad and just say like it's bad for your lungs or like that kind of simple like simplification kind of way compared to high school students we still have fun with them um, we still engage do energizers uh, but just not make it seem like it's a uh, what's it called as if we're treating them like kids. We're treating them more like, you know, adults, but we're showing them like, it's cool to be doing what we're doing. It's cool to be presenting. It's cool to live the life, live a tobacco free life. And um, because in high school, you know, in high school, people like to do, just be cool and do cool for the wrong reasons. And so we try to change the norm of that and just show like, it's cool to live a tobacco free lifestyle. <laughs> I agree, Carlos. Um, what are some you of the 100%. things that you've seen? Oh no, you're great. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen that have, have been beneficial in utilizing peer education in your program? And also, what are what's an obstacle that you've seen, or what are some of the challenges as an adult implementing peer education? Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind about challenges is definitely the um, not everyone's going to be engaged. Um, you just can't force it on some people. Um, you try to just, you know, stick to um, what works best for you when you present or when you do peer education. Um, sometimes, depending if some people don't get enough sleep, so they sleep through it, and um, you try to wake them up and energize them to the best of your ability. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you just have to realize that if they're there, hopefully they're there because they want to be there. Um, like for example, I say what, we assume that all the participants that come, they are there because they care about the issue or it's their first time getting involved with tobacco prevention. So we try to find that balance of like, of like, you know, helping those who have been there already kind of teach them something new, but at the same time for those who are new to say what, um, give them that reason, give them their why to keep going forward with tobacco prevention. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, keep that balance of overall, keep them engaged, um, show that it's fun to do what we do. And um, and then you said, what was the other question? I answered the second one, but the first one went right through me. <laughs> or did I, I actually, I'll, I'll invite Amanda to respond. I'd love to hear, being an adult that works with young people, what, you know, what is challenging about implementing peer education? Ooh, um, so sometimes it can be challenging to work with youth because they want to incorporate the new fads that are, you know, going on right at that moment, and that's and that's not a bad thing necessarily. But um, you know, one of the things that we did, the, I think, the first year um, for peer education and awareness of our coalition was a, a flash mob, and that was really great and it was really awesome. And trying to um, recreate something like that when it's no longer um, a, a, a fad is is not something we're going to be able to do. So just trying to always keep them consistent and and focused is is a challenge for sure. But but it's a it's a great challenge to have, um, especially when they want to be there and they want to be teaching. They they are passionate about what they're doing, but um, keeping them focused. Got it. Um, what I want to do now, again, just so we can continue to plug away, um, we've had some awesome stuff shared already. Um, if you could share, uh, Amanda, and Carlos, you spoke a little bit already, but I, I will give you a chance after Amanda shares. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Amanda, on just the, the overall benefits of getting young people involved in policy advocacy. I know that you all took some youth down to Austin. Um, I'm not sure because the, the ordinance, at least in Wichita Falls, passed like right at the beginning of y'all's funding. Um, just uh, you know, one or two observations about getting young people involved in policy advocacy. Well, that's a really good question, and I think it's key to get uh, young people involved in policy advocacy. We don't have enough voters as it is to vote um, uh, that are educated enough to make decisions when voting, and so I think that that's important to get them involved um, while they're young, even in something that's as specific as tobacco prevention. Um, because then they they know enough about it to make an informed decision as they grow up and and make the decisions for our, themselves and for our future. And then I think that it's also important um, just so that they know that their voice is going to be heard right now, not not just in the future, but also right now, and that they can involve change today and tomorrow. And then and then again, I'm going to say focus focus their words, be intentional about what they say and how they say it, and knowing how to be diplomatic um, in order to get things the way that they want them. Awesome. And Carlos, you, you spoke earlier, actually a couple of examples that you shared were your involvement in policy advocacy. If you had to share one thing that you could tell adults about involving young people in policy advocacy, what would you tell adults? Um, just regarding policy advocacy, um, specifically with the youth or just in general with policy advocacy? Get, getting young people involved in policy advocacy. Um, definitely. Um, okay, well, okay, for me, I, I guess the one thing I would share is just that, um, I didn't start going after policy advocacy until I learned about the campaign for tobacco free kids and how um, to really get that experience of going to DC for symposium or becoming the youth advocate of the year, I would have to work on youth uh, or policy advocacy. And so the fact that I, um, I went from not knowing anything to a lot about it over the course of three years, um, the one thing I would share is that, oh, that's a good question. Oh my goodness, I'm lost. But I will say, um, I will say that, oh, okay, um, what's it called? That, oh my goodness, that's a hard question. Okay, I think I got it. It's just that working with policy advocacy work is very difficult, it's hard, especially when you're a youth, and there's so many things that we don't know and you might not know, so definitely don't be afraid to find people who do know, like resources like the American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, TXA What, or Say What, um, 
The campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, like if you know someone that's worked on policy advocacy, ask them what they did and how they got to that point. Because um, I was just going with what um, I was, what I've seen, what I've heard, but I really didn't completely understand it until I actually went through it myself. Um, for each city or whatever you, or what particular law you're going for, it's going to be completely different. Each it's a, it's a different environment for each city because each city council members um, usually are different depending. And so mine was a completely different experience compared to people that I know from other states or towns. And so you kind of, it's a learning process as you go. But definitely, uh, if I had to start over and do it all over again, I wish I started my sophomore year by connecting with the American Heart Association association connecting with the American Cancer Society and having them help me from the very beginning rather than at the very end where it kind of I don't want to say it was my fault that we lost by 10 votes but it could have made a difference if we started together at the start to actually pass the smoke free ordinance because it was just a 10 difference vote from the public voting that we lost the ordinance so that's what I would advise the most is just um, keep your youth engaged and you know use the resources there's a lot of resources out there Awesome. So with that, you know, there are different ways we've talked about we can get young people involved, whether it's through uh, different activities that they host, through peer education, and then through policy advocacy. Carlos, I'll, I'll pass, pass it back to you now um, and then uh, have you uh, chat with uh, someone you know very well, uh, someone on our staff, um, and someone that's helped you along the way as well, uh, along with DJ, uh, in, and that's, uh, actually, I'll let you introduce her. Okay. Okay, so yeah, we're getting, we're approaching the final topic of this webinar, um, but I would definitely like to um, introduce Miss um, Kathleen Bates. Like I said, she um, is a youth specialist for the Teen Ambassador Program, um, and I work along, alongside her uh, as a consultant. So we help, you know, mentor, guide the Teen Ambassadors. Um, and so yes, I am going to hand it off to Miss Kathleen, um, and she can take a moment to introduce herself. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will be brief because I know we've had a lot of fantastic conversation and we would like to be respectful of your time. Um, so just very briefly introduce myself. I've been working in tobacco prevention for five years now, going on my sixth year, and it's been a privilege. Um, that's really where I was able to harness my passion for empowering people of all ages and creating healthy communities. Um, then I was able to start working with youth uh, through a nonprofit in San Antonio as well. And and working with youth has definitely been the highlight of my career. I still get to today. It brings me a lot of joy, and it definitely keeps me young at heart. And for those who work with youth, you definitely understand what I say. <laughs> so we'll just go ahead and move forward. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so this year, Kip Butt stays on March 21st. Um, and so can groups host Texas Tobacco Free Kids Day activities on any other days in March? Yes, absolutely. So um, we understand that schools, well, just groups in general, have a difficult time hosting something on a particular day because there are unforeseen circumstances. Um, so you don't have to host it on March 21st. You can host it any time in the month of March. We just want to see you guys doing some fantastic work during that month. Definitely. Um, how can Say What help youth groups get involved in Texas Tobacco Free Kids Day or Kicks Butt Day? So Say What offers some fantastic resources in order to help further Texas youth groups' efforts, not only with educating others, but about the harmful effects of tobacco use um, when they're aiding in the creation of healthier schools and communities to live a life tobacco-free. And as you can see on your screen, one of those things that Say What offers are mini-grant kits. And these are basically projects in a box, and they have been specifically designed with youth in mind. We come up with materials that will grab their attention so that they come up to you and interact with you, or we design the materials um, so that youth would actually want to use them in their projects and their activities within their school and their community. Um, our mini grant kits are 100% free to request and use. You do have to be a registered group on the Say What app in order to request a kit. And uh, we have a video a little later on that will show you what that process looks like. But as you can see, this new slide, we have three new kits that are currently available to request. 
The Quidditch kit is more cessation focused. So if your group of youth really want to help people struggling with a tobacco addiction uh, find help and quit, that's a fantastic resource for people to use. Our Live the Life kit was uh, created after our theme this year, Live the Life, just encouraging people um, to live life tobacco free, but also show people that it is easy and it looks cool and people are already doing it. Um, and then the last kit that we have available is the pledge kit. And the pledge kit is a fun kit to use. It's easy to use. You could use it during lunchtime in a cafeteria or if you have a school health fair or if you're attending a community health event. Um, our kits do deplete rather quickly. So if you like what you see, don't wait too long and create a group online and request that kit. So this is our new web app. Um, like I said, the process of creating a group is very simple. We have a cute video to show you, which we're going to uh, go ahead and load over and, and get started for you. Does your group want to make a difference and help people live healthy, tobacco-free lifestyles? Say What is the resource for helping youth and adults work together to make tobacco history. And TXSayWhat.com makes it easy to get connected to other groups, resources, and training opportunities throughout Texas. Groups and group leaders earn points and badges that can give you access to awards, scholarships, and more. Leaders can easily create projects, request free mini-grant kits, and report back on how your project went to earn points for project leaders and your group. Find out about upcoming events and register your group for fun, peer-led training opportunities to help people live tobacco-free. All you need to do is create a group and invite leaders. Just fill out some basic information about your group, set up your user account, then invite other leaders using their email addresses. Every group must have at least one youth and one adult leader to start earning points and badges. So get the group leaders you invite connected as soon as possible. Once your group is created, you're ready to help Texans stand up, speak up, and be tobacco free all across the Lone Star State. Is your group. So if you have some buffering, you can check out the check out our website for the website video because the process is so simple. Uh, we've redesigned it with the user in mind, so we highly encourage you to go ahead, go back and watch that so that you know how to make your your group on our web app. And when you do create your group, this is what your home page will look like. We have a lot of stuff going on, so I'll just explain a couple of things. But when you log in, this is the page that you'll see in order to create a project and request a kit. You'll see at the at the bottom of the um, you, I'm sorry, you'll see at the bottom of the page there is a blue project box and there's a little small box. Uh oh, we're moving slides. Okay, there we go. Um <laughs> so that blue box that says project is where you'll be able to create a project and request your kit. Uh, right above that is a green box that says connect. We've created that with users in mind to connect with other youth groups across the state in your area if you want to host a large event and there are five other youth groups in your hometown. That's the option to connect with them and, and start working with them so that you can make your project bigger and better because we know uh, more people, more power we have, right? Um, above that are stats. So that just shows you how much total outreach you and your group have been able to reach, the amount of people you've been able to reach. And then that small box, that small gray box on the side is where you'll be able to register for upcoming events that we have. So our Say What Action Summit, conference. So um, it's just another easy resource to use for those who have created their groups online. Another free resource that Say What offers are Action Summit. Um, they are an action pack day. It's held on a Saturday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And both youth and adult participants will receive t basic tobacco prevention education, team building skills, leadership skills in the morning. And then after lunch, 
they get to actually use that information and those skills they've learned and apply it to the community that the summit is located in. So not only are we teaching them what to do, we're then going to show people what to do. And I think that's the best part is feeling this sense of um, accomplishment and, and you feel good about yourself for making the community healthier. Um, and better living the life tobacco free. We have another cute video to show you so you have an idea of what that day would look like. We apologize for all the buffering issues with the videos. Please go back our, to our website and check out our videos because um, they're just, they're they're so they're just so you definitely want to go to a summit after watching that video. We will be hosting five summits across the state this year. We'll be visiting Wichita Falls, McAllen, Dyball, Pima, and then here in San Marcos. And the first two summits, which tell Falls and McAllen, registration is currently full, but the last year is still open. So if you live in the area or your group is up for road trip, we would absolutely love to see you guys there. Again, it's, it's a fantastic day. We didn't get three hours of community service, um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm sorry, breakfast, lunch, and snack, and then a commemorative t-shirt. So uh, um, another free resource for you guys to use, this isn't um, say what, this is uh, Catch Global Foundation. They've partnered with uh, CVS Health to bring middle schools and high schools across the nation a free e-cigarette prevention curriculum. Um, and the effort to aid in this idea of a tobacco-free generation. So it's another tool that you can use when educating your youth about tobacco prevention but focused on e-cigarettes. And as if the being free wasn't a great perk alone, this does meet the TEACH standards for middle school for 6th through 8th grade. So two uh, great points that you could bring up uh, if you work in a school or you're trying to get into a school. And then lastly, I know Catch My Breath, this, pr this particular curriculum, it can also be implemented in a community setting. So if you work with the YMCA group or Boys and Girls Club, um, this, this curriculum can also be implemented. So again, if you're interested in that free resource, that free tool, you can sign up at catchmybreath.org slash enroll. Thank you. Awesome. All right, Carlos, as a, not only a regional youth advocate of the year award winner, but also a national a youth advocate of the year award winner for the campaign for tobacco free kids, um, you're probably the per best person to tell us a little bit about some of the resources they have available to help youth organizations host activities for Kick Butts Day and Texas Tobacco Free Kids Day. Definitely. Um, so Kick Butts Day. Um, 
It is a national day of activism that empowers youth to like stand out, speak up, and seize control against tobacco. So on Kids Butt Day, March 21st, um, they usually have over a thousand events that take place in schools and communities across the entire nation. Um, and even around the world, because um, the campaign for tobacco-free kids is um, more international now. So um, some kid but say activities um, that they're they have is in the past that they've had at least um, was the um, not um, I'm not a replacement. So some um, youth advocate named Maggie she had made a social media awareness uh, project where it said I'm not a replacement and it said. Um, like you write down like what you are, like you're passionate or I'm a doctor or something and you post it on social media and you put hashtag um, not a replacement. And so that was a big uh, social media project that took place about a couple of years ago. But one specifically um, that is now um, big for the kickback say is hashtag be the first pledge activity kit and so this is a pretty cool kit because um, it's pretty easy you they give you a the, if you look in the picture you can see that big yellow poster and people just sign their names um, and pledging to be the first be the first uh, generation tobacco free generation um, and take a stand against tobacco and so it comes with it looks like uh, instructions, the poster, um, hashtag be the first stickers, and um, and yellow buttons. So it's pretty cool um, project kit for Kicks Butt Day. If you're interested, I would definitely check it out at kickbuttstay dot um, is it org? Yeah, dot org. Um, and then. Another thing that they recently launched this past year was taking down tobacco. Um, this is an online course. Um, their goal is to reach a, a million um, youth by 2020. And I actually think um, as of last uh, November, it was a pretty high number. I want to say it was over 200 thousand already or something like that or even I think it might have been a half a million I forgot the number but it was definitely a high number so a lot of uh, people have been using this online course to really um, train youth and adults who are not familiar with tobacco prevention uh, to get them involved get them educated teach them the different events activities um, skills they need to fight against tobacco and so there's a lot of different online courses like messaging matters so like how you message the media or speaking to decision makers etc so it's pretty it's pretty neat it literally if I was my fresh when I was my freshman if or if I when if I was a freshman again and if I took this course um, it would have been very useful for me because I was new at the time and it would kind of just speed me up instead of go through all these years of learning things by step by step it's a pretty unique and um, I definitely would check it out and um, you know get involved with this and share to the youth and um, it's a really great tool to use as well. In addition to that, one of the things that's really helpful as well is the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids also offers a lot of grants and incentives to use the Taking Down Tobacco uh, online course. So in addition to it being free for anyone to access and there being an online management system that tracks people's progress, it uh, gives you the opportunity to earn points, uh, but also to request grants and, um, and to earn free stuff uh, by get delivering the taking down tobacco program in person whether you're young actually it's predominantly young people but also adults are eligible as well so all of that being said we are now instead of 11:45, it's 11:47, so we're 17 minutes over um, I know that there have been um, one or two questions posed in the chat which we really appreciate you guys uh, not only hopping in there and asking questions but then also uh, chatting with each other as well if you haven't noticed, we've listed some of the links there to the videos that were shared since we had some technology issues with buffering. Um, but otherwise, if there happen to be any questions that anyone has for Carlos, for Amanda, for Kathleen, or, or for myself, um, and then also for DJ, we'll be, we can forward these on, and then we'll take the opportunity to, to post the responses um, uh, after the, the webinar. We will be archiving it, uh, so you'll be able to access it on txawa.com slash webinar. So looking, taking a peek in the chat right now, if you've got any questions, now is the time to type those in. Hey Reggie, can I uh, make a comment real quick? Absolutely. 
Uh, I just want to address what uh, Carlos said about the taking down tobacco.org um, training. So I agree fully with him. If if we would have had that training year one, I think the youth would have been more advanced m as we moved forward in the grant, um, just because of our own challenges of uh, internally of the health department and then also um, trying to get our group who was new and trying to train us and what we were doing and, and things like that and everybody finding their own delegated role um, of, of how we're going to push forward. If we would have had that training, I think that would have helped a lot. But then again, I mean, there's always those uh, phases that you're going to work in anyway. It just, it would have been really great, FYI. And then there was a question about one of the events that, that we held and that the adults w thought it would be going to be su a successful event um, if there were a lot of people who attended and that was because one of our key performance measures is that um, we have so many people attend but the youth um, thought that their event was very successful because they brainstormed, planned, and implemented the the event in and of itself, even though there weren't a whole lot of people, uh, we did do an a after action uh, report, and that's something that we do on I think every single I mean I want to say every single event that we have we do after action uh, reports with the youth and then um, we even will do like after conference we come back and we do an after action report over conference and um, those are really great and there's some great templates that you can use online or if you would like the templates uh, that we use, you can always um, email me at amanda.kennedy at wichitafallstx.gov. Actually, I'll even in, I'll, I'll invite you, Amanda, to since there are a lot, most of the people in the room are uh, TPCC staff. If that's something that hasn't been uh, made really available, that might be a great addition to the base camp okay. uh, TPCC collabo project. Um, with that being said, I just want to um, invite and remind everyone that here in just a handful of weeks is not only Kick Butts Day on March 21st, but also Texas Tobacco Free Kids Day. Um, why, why do we call it that? Um, mainly because some schools can't say butts. So it's Texas Tobacco Free Kids Day uh, across the state of Texas. And we also invite you to, to host something if not on the 21st, any day in March. Uh, if your youth organization hasn't already joined TXA What, we want you to hop onto the web app and get your organization connected because that's exactly how you can request mini grant kits from Kathleen uh, and any, get any technical assistance that you might want with uh, youth, your youth organization. So with all that being said, uh, we just want to thank thank you to Carlos. I really appreciate you you helping take the lead on this webinar, this first webinar for Say What in 2018. Thanks to Amanda and DJ Gonzalez and Kathleen for hopping on as, as guests and, and speakers. Really appreciate everything that y'all had to share. Uh, everyone, please look for an evaluation email to come into your inbox here in the next couple of days. And also want to go ahead and announce that we'll be having our second webinar of 2018 in April, and that one will cover e-cigarette prevention. So we'll be getting some more information about that webinar on txawhat.com slash webinar. So check that out uh, here in the next couple of weeks for more information on how to register. Uh, also, if you're not already following us on the, at txawhat.com, or if you haven't visited TX, or sorry, at txawhat, or if you haven't visited txawhat.com, we invite you to do that. Otherwise, uh, Carlos, Kathleen, Amanda, any final words before we sign everybody off? Terrific. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks again to everybody for joining us today. Really appreciate y'all, guests and presenters, and we hope to see everyone back in April. Thank you. Bye, everyone.